this module is what uh, we're going to talk about three things, uh, hierarchical parallelism. And so this is, you know, another way to uh, express uh, parallelism when you have nested loop. Um, we have the scratch space, which is some uh, special memory that you can use when you're doing hierarchical parallelism, and then quickly talk about the unique token. Okay, so like I just said, the goal of uh, using a hierarchical parallelism is to expose uh, more parallelism that you would be able to do otherwise. And so you have to work with some teams and that uh, allows you to do some uh, coordination that you cannot do otherwise. Uh, so we go back to our, you know, in our product example. Um, so, so far what we've done is we have, um, you know, exposed parallelism just on the row, right? Uh, that means that though that we need a lot of rows uh, if you want to like, you know, fill a GPU and, you know, you only have like 500 uh, row, you're not going to be able to fill it, right? So you're not going to be have enough parallelism at the row level to saturate your GPU. So what can we do? We can use uh, atomics or you can use teams. So first, um, let's talk about atomics. So what we can do is basically just say, okay, I'm going to have a parallel for, right? And I'm going to parallelize over my entire like, row times columns. Right now, this so how you can do it, how you, you can do that like this way, and now you need an atomic. Now, this is not going to be good, uh, performance wise. Why? Oops. There are like two reasons one is you know, you have a lot of conflicts on your atomics, everybody's trying to add in results. Uh, you have also, like uh, we talked about before, you have the issue of the access pattern. Now you're going to have a terrible access pattern and it will really slow your code down. Uh, so another way you could think about it is, well, I'm going for each row, you know, I'm going to do a parallel reduce, right? Uh, and this is basically what uh, the hierarchical parallelism works, right? So, so you have two parallel reduce that are going to be nested. Um, one thing that you have when you're using the thread teams things, that's where I'm, we're going to discuss, it's for now no, you can have access to synchronize, right? And you, before that, when you run, um, you know, on a kernels, we tell you, you cannot synchronize, you don't know what's running concurrently. But here, when you're running on a uh, tree, then you can know that these are running concurrently and you can synchronize them. So if we go back at uh, you know our examples, how it's going to work. So we're going to launch, uh, we have a one parallel launch of n teams and each team will run under a row. And then we will split this um, to have a reductions on this row. So, very high level, this is what I'll, it would look like at the end. So you have this parallel reduce with a new kind of policy, right? We've introduced a range policy yesterday, which was a 1D. Uh, Raul talked about the MD range policy, right? And here we have this new thing that's a team policy, okay? Then you have your uh, Lambda function uh, as usual, right? And then here you have your uh, second level uh, of parallelism, right? Uh, yeah, so this is basically the comparison. When you do a flat parallelism, right, you have a range policy, you have an element. Now, when you do hierarchical, hierarchical parallelism, you have to say a team size and a number of team. And so your number of work is the number of teams times the number of, times the size of each teams, right? Uh, there is um, several things you can do um, when you with a team. So when you have a team, you know, your operator, it will get uh, basically a handle on this team. 
and the handle we you can guess from that how many teams you have so it's the league size which teams you are in the league rank how many threads you have in your team the team size and which threads you are on this team and finally we allows you to synchronize uh, all the threads in a team so if we go back to our first uh, our example right here is the example when we are using um, the atomic um so why you know why can't uh, we use the atomic again you know we have we um we have you know the first level of parallelism on the row the second on the column i could decide that i'm going to make you know my team size the number of columns right mm -hmm. um this is not a good idea and the reason it is it's because there are some uh limit on the architectures on how big a team can be right uh if you're on CUDA uh you know I don't think you can go over like 1054 something like that right so there is a limit so you cannot you know you you cannot put the number of row to the number of team you have to take a number that's adapted to your architecture so one way to do that is to say okay well since I cannot have you know, a team size, that's my entire row, I'll take a smaller number, right? And then I will do the work uh, myself, right? So this is this for loop here, right? We are, the size is lower than it was before, but then each thread is going to, you know, work on several elements, okay? The problem in this one, it's, so you're using a, part, a regular for loop, right? And so now you have the an access issue. This will access the memory in a, a coalescent way, not in a cache way, right? So you have the same issue you had for the range policy uh, with the poor access patterns. You have it here too. So yeah. Uh, so this is basically. Um, now, if we look again at what we're trying to do, right, we have our for loop outside, this is our functor, and hit these levels, you do a reduction. But in Cocos, we already use, we already have parallel reduce, and so you're going to use one of our parallel reduce to do it. Okay, and so this is how you get this nested parallel pattern. So, um, yeah, so this is how it looks like, right? We have a parallel reduce. You have a team thread range. You get your team member, and here you have your lender. Uh, you do your, you know, your uh, reduce, and then you can like pro broadcast everything. Uh, one thing to notice is here, you don't, uh, you cannot put Cocos Lambda um, as the macro. And the reason is you've already, you know, you're already on the GPU and you cannot have, you cannot have a Davis host Lambda when you're already on the GPU, right? So you cannot use Cocos Lambda here. So you, you could use, um, you know, take everything by reference or by value. It's kind of up to you. Uh, we advise people to do it by value, but if you need it, you could do by reference because all your data has already been moved to the GPU, right? So this is um, not an issue anymore. Um, yeah. So all the, you know, the intra-team reduction, everything is done inside Focus. Okay, so you can have, um, an arbitrary number of inner loop, right? In this case, we have the parallel auto loop, which is a, a team policy. And then inside it, uh, we have a team thread, a team thread range. And you could have like two, three, four, five, six, seven of it. There is no limit on the number of nested loop, but you cannot nest another team thread range inside a team thread range, okay? Uh, and you obviously can take any combina combination of parallel for and parallel reduce. So this could be a parallel for, and then you have here parallel reduce, and then another parallel for. 
and so on. Uh, you, yeah, so you can also let um, Cocos decide um, the size of your team. Um, so if you use the Cocos auto, then Cocos will pick for you. Uh, in general, we're going to do, you know, something that's like, something that's a, a multiple of, of a war or a wavefront, right? So the maximum size, it's 1024. Usually if you, we know we pick 128 or 256. If you want to pick something different, uh, yeah, it's up to you. Uh, yeah, that's uh, not uh, used anymore. So now we let's do the first uh, exercise. So let's uh, keep on. So um, if you so this is basically um, you know what we had the first time we tried to, this exercise. Uh, so this is done with, um, you know, flat parallelism, and we just uh, parallelize along the row. And if you do the exercise, this is what you should get. No, so there's like several things to notice. Okay, the first thing is uh, here, you know, you get, you know, maximum bandwidth um, on the GPU at around like. Uh, let's say 10 to the 5, oops, sorry, 10 to the 5 row, well, here you can reach that to like a thousand, right? So you need a lot less. Um, so this is what the goal, right, of the uh, Yarkeo parallelism, you expose more parallelism, and so you can, you know, reach, uh, you can use your GPU uh, better earlier. Another thing to notice is we see this rapid uh, drop, right? Uh, and you don't have it here. So why is that? Why do, does it drop? So the issue is it's a fixed size. And so when you increase the number of row, uh, you decrease the number of column. And so you can end up at a place where, uh, you know, you have a team size of, let's say, like 256 and you only have um, 10 columns, right? And so now most of your uh, threads are actually not doing anything. So that's some waste. And also you're still doing a reduction over all these threads, right? We have like a, like a three or whatever, it's going to be a lot of work, right? So you can get away with some of it by just decreasing the size uh, of your team. Uh, but there is a limit on how much you can decrease it, right? This, if you are on, you know, on CUDA, uh, going under 32 might not be uh, super useful. Um, and so there is a point where if there is end of polyps that's uh, exposed through the row, you don't want to do, you know, expose more polyps through the hierarchical. Uh, one more thing is look at the layout. So here, you know, on the GPU, you get the best results, you know, when the memory is colorless and it's a layout left, but here it's a layout right. And the reason we it's the best results with layout right, it's because no, um, you, uh, you expose the parallelism on the rightmost index instead of the leftmost index. And that's why you need to switch uh, your layout, right? This is only for the GPU. On the CPU, everything is already it, it's already works. Okay. So there is uh, a third level uh, of parallelism. Uh, it's a, that's what we call call the vector, and it uh, really maps uh, on the CPU on like a, a vector line, right? On the vector vector. Uh, on the CPU and on the GPU, it's like a sub warp level. Um, you cannot access, you know, the vector line ID. So what we really do here is we do not uh, force the vectorizations, but we, you know, tell the compiler, hey, this is something you should look at. Try to uh, to vectorize uh, if uh, 
if you can, right? Look at uh, your heuristics and let us know. So here's basically all of these levels, um, you know, in one slide. At the other levels, you have the team policy, okay? Then you have the team threat policy. And if you need one more level of uh, nesting, you can have the threat vector, okay? At the same level as the team threat, we also have the team vector. And so that's, you know, if you need to uh, have, uh, if you want to expose, you know, threat and vector uh, parallelism. So now we'll, uh, you know, play a little bit with uh, some of the parallel reduce and see, you know, what do you get? So here, you know, it's a simple range policy. Uh, so it's a 1D. So if you do this, you know, here you just loop uh, and increment by one. So this thread sum, it's 10 and you do partial sum plus 10. So your, the value is going to be the number of threads times 10. Okay, this is, great. I'm sure that's what you expected. Um, yeah, that's just what I just said. Oops, uh, sorry, I, so this is the next levels. So if you do um, two level, uh, if you use, um, yeah, if you use it uh, threading, uh, sorry, the article, no, if you look at this, the number, uh, the total sum is going to be the number of teams times the number, times the size of each team, right? It's basically how many threads you're running is this, uh, this times this, and we still do times 10. So you get that number. Now, if you use, uh, you know, nested parallelism, what are you going to get? Um, so you don't get what you would expect, which would be number of teams times teams times times 10, uh, because you have one more level, okay? And so this will already give you a team size times 10 number, right? So this is team times times 10. Then you do that again a second time and number of times on team size, right? So by nesting it, now you get an extra team size, uh, you know, run. So this is probably not what you were expecting. And so for that, we have something called single. Um, and it's really very similar to what you have uh, in OpenMP, where you have the single directive. We have two different kinds of uh, policy for the single. We have per team and per thread. Uh, per team, it's exactly, you know, you have one for the, each team, only one of them is going to do it. The per threads uh, look strange. It does nothing on the CPU, but on the GPU, what's going to happen is you're going to mask all the threads in the world except for one, okay? There's like two things you can do it. With the single, you can do, you know, this single and it takes, um, no arguments, we have lambda and takes no arguments, that will just run the code, or you can also take a value that will be broadcasted. So you come here, only one, you know, thread per team is going to execute this and then broadcast the value to everybody. So there is another example now, another, um, uh, exercise and this in exercise introduced, you know, with the vector team vector loop. So again, if you want to do it, I'll give you uh, ten minutes. Let's continue. Uh, so this is, you know, what you get uh, when you do a uh, three-level parallelism, um, and so basically. You see, you get uh, you know a little bit uh, better for lower numbers, but yeah, it's not. Uh, it's when you increase the size, it doesn't make much of a difference. So this is something, you know, the three-level parallelism. It's when you're already, 
you know, really, uh, when you're looking to optimize your code at the end, this is something you can try to see if it works. This is not something we uh, encourage people to like design their code around, right? A two level parallelism is usually makes sense, you know, for your structure, for the three level, it's more when you are like looking to get, um, you know, the more performance at the end. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, just the summary of what we did. Uh, so we've introduced, you know, the the thread teams, the vector teams, uh, and you have, you know, ways to have something that's executed only per team or per thread using the single pattern. Okay, now we'll talk about the scratch memory. So this is a special kind of uh, memory that you can only access um, using hierarchical parallelism. Um, okay, so first, scratch the scratch space. We have like two different kinds of scratch space. We have a level level zero and level one. Level zero, it's pretty small, but it's pretty fast. Uh, it's usually something you know. Something that's like a L1 cache. Uh, level one is much bigger, but this is you know something that's much uh, slower, and you can uh, use it in uh, two different ways. This uh, cache memory. One is if it's you need some um, temporary storage that you need only for you know a team or for a thread. This is the kind of things uh, you want to use. Or if uh, there is like some data that you need to uh, like read very frequently, right? Uh, so this, you know, something like uh, in uh, NVIDIA, you have a shared memory. This is a way to access the shared memory. Okay, so we'll discuss mainly uh, the manual, manually managed cache, not so much you know, the other way it's using the, the private, but, uh, you know, it's very similar. So if we go back uh, to our example, uh, I mean, slightly different here. Um, and uh, so we have a matrix vector multiplication. So how what can we, you know, expose uh, the part, how you can write this? You can write it as a for loop, you know, let's say here it's uh, some, uh, you know, Let's say quality of points and see is your vector size. You can write it like this. If you're in 3D, you know, you have like a, if it's a, like let's say let's say that instead of having quality of points and the um that you're applying, now you have like a mesh, and so you're going to all the cells, and then on each cell you go to your quality of points, and then you have a vector uh, size, right? So this is something that you will have often if you have like uh something like finite elements, right? So how can you uh, parallelize that, right? You can say, okay, each thread will have the number of element, or you can say each thread will have the number of element times my number of quadrature point. Uh, and then the thread and they'll, um, or you can just use heaven, you know, on the vector size, right? So you have like different ways you can parallelize, parallelize this uh, this loop, right? At each four, basically beyond only the external four, the two externals, or all of them. So here we're going to focus on the second level. Uh, one way you can do it it's uh, using an MD range policy, right? So this will just collapse the two external four loop. Uh, you can also do it using the uh, hierarchical parallelism, right? And so here the external loop, you know, you don't see it. It's in the, it's outside, but here's, you know, your functor and you have this loop inside, right? It loops over the quadrature point. Now, if you look at this, well, yeah, there is no real advantage. Uh, but if you look at this, I'd like something to... Um, oh, no, sorry. Okay, so now let's look at what's the scratch pad. Right? So scratch pad, basically, it's some special memory that 
um, each team will have access to, right? So you have your global memory and then each team has access only to them. And so that allows them to uh, coordinate on the scratch part, right? It has faster access, they can coordinate on it and uh, it also isolated them from the others. So, like I said before, the scratch pad, like level zero, it's usually something like, you know, an L1 cache. So it's a lot faster, but it's a lot smaller too, right? And uh, when you have a, you know, NVIDIA or AMD GPU, it really matches to the, um, the shared memory. And so it's very small latency. Um, and, you know, you don't have the requirement of having uh, the coalescing access. Uh, so for the CPU, you don't have that kind of special hardware. Uh, you don't have this like shared memory thing, uh, but it still helps writing the code using Scratchpad for cache awareness. So if you have something that you're going to like keep reading over and over again, it's actually useful to put that in the Scratchpad, right? So that's uh, when you want to use it. If you're like, if it's just to read it once, and then you're never reading again, you probably don't want to put that in a scratch pad. Um, another way it's uh, that you can use it is if uh, you have something that's really, you need a temporary array, uh, some temporary size, right? Uh, one way you could do it is at the beginning, you say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to have an element and, and each uh, element has, you know, needs a workspace of size W, and I allocate, you know, an uh, array of signs n times w, uh, and then you know each element is going to work on its own workspace. Um, that's fine, but you may need a lot of memory. So instead, what you can do is using the scratch memory, and then instead of having to allocate something that's the size of n, you can just uh, have one for each thread and one for each team, right? So this is a lot more efficient memory-wise. Okay, so how does it work? So the first thing you have to do is you have to tell Cocos how much memory you will need to use, and then you create the scratch memory view inside your kernel. Um, so this is how it would look like. So first I say, okay, I want you know my scratch file view, and the memory space is associated to your execution space, and in the span of special ones called scratch memory space then you need to compute how much memory you will require. So you can use for that the share memory size. So why can't you use it yourself? Why can't you compute it yourself, the how much memory you will need in bytes? The reason is, well, there, is there may be some padding that we need, you know? And so these things will allocate something that's at least the size of what you require, but it can be bit, uh, bigger if we need, uh, yeah, if we need to do some padding. Uh, then here in the policy, you have to really tell, okay, here is how much memory I will need and at which level uh, you want to do it. So level zero for like shared memory, level one if you just want to be uh, HBM memory. And then, um, yeah, you can create a view uh, associated with this scratch pad and now you have a scratch pad and you can use it. So here is how um, the code would look like. Uh, so here now we have this, this scratch memory instead of using the big element that we had, we had to do and load it here, right? So how do you want to do it? Uh, can how do you want to you know write in the scratch uh, part? You could do it with one thread for everything. The problem is this is going to be serial, so it's going to be uh, really slow. What you could do uh, you know each thread loads one entry. Uh, the problem is here is you have a, you know you need your team size will need to match your vector size, otherwise it won't work. And so the solution here is to use the team vector range. That's, you know, 
will use the maximum um, pallets available. So this is uh, what we are going to do, right? You have your scratch pad, you fill it up, and here you use it. Um, there is an issue with the following code, right? And it's something that uh, you know we've touched a few times. It's there is um, this file for for one trade can keep working while it's the others are not there yet, right? So you basically need to fence at this point, otherwise you could start working with a scratch pad that's not uh, filled yet, right? And for that you use the team barrier. So now all the the member of the teams are going to wait until this point and then go to the next. And that will ensure that your scratch pad is uh, filled before you start using it. Okay, <clears throat> so there is a, an exercise about this. So again, uh, I will give you like uh, 10 minutes to do it. All right, uh, let's keep on. So here um, we see the difference between uh, you know using the scratch memory or not using it. Uh, you see that it makes a you know a pretty good uh, difference on the GPU, but not so much uh, on the CPU, which is you know due to the fact that the GPU has some special memory that we can uh, access now. Okay, so here is just you know the the API that we have. Um, so like I we've said before, you have two different kinds of level, uh, zero and one. Uh, you can decide if you want something per team per thread, or you can have you know a mix of the two. You can say I need so so much memory per team and also so much uh, memory per thread, and you can also decide that you know you want to use level zero and level one right for different uh for different use so this is the summary uh so the scratch memory can be used basically uh in two different ways uh when it's if you just need some uh temporary um workspace you can also use it uh as you know your own managed cache depending of uh, on the architecture you have two levels, a large one and a small one. The large one is slow, the small one is fast. Uh, nothing too surprising here. Okay, the last thing uh, I want to talk uh, about today is uh, the unit uh, token. So there are some uh, algorithms uh, that, uh, you know, it would be nice to have something that's like a thread ID, right? Some algorithms works better like that. Now, if you're on a CPU, it's uh, it's fine. Let's say you're on a, uh, you're using OpenMP, you can ask, you know, what's your thread number, and that's fine. There is no such thing on a GPU, and so the unique token is, you know, the Cocos uh, object that tries to provide this for everybody. So let's say that uh, you have a, a random uh, a random number generator. So you have basically uh, a seed, you set the seed, and then each element is going to uh, get the next value. So how do you do it to get something that's unique here? Right in the OpenMP, you can use thread ID. Um, that's what's going to be unique. On CUDA, though, there is no such thing, right? The only thing you could do is like, oh, I'm going to look at uh, my thread ID and my block, but that's basically just going you give you back the the I, right? So there is no way it, that does not uh, this concept does not exist. And so, what we've created for that it's uh, the unique token, right? So. A unique token, what basically is happening, uh, it's a way to get an ID and then release it, right? So you have to create here 
you know, you create your unique token. Okay. Uh, you can decide how many unique tokens you need. Um, that's like, you know, it's with some of the, in the constructor. And then you get an ID and at the end you release it. No, you cannot get more uh, than one ID. So if you try to acquire twice, or if you do not release it, basically what's going to happen is that uh, it's going to uh, hang your code, right? So it's basically trying to get an ID, get uh, an ID, but it can't get it, and so it just everything is going to hang. So like I said, you can uh, decide on the size of the token, the unique token, but by default it will be the concurrency uh, of the execution space you're working with. So sometimes what you also want is have something that's uh, you know global, a global version of it. And we also uh, provide this. Uh, you have to basically add uh, these template parameters, right? That just say that, okay, I'm working now with a global. Here I'm also working with a global. And instead of having something that's tied to an instance, now you have something that's uh, you know, global, and it can be used for things like if you're using legions. And so, yeah, basically what happens is when you get a token for a token bar, there is no risk that the ID will conflict. Uh, you can also work uh, with a per team uh, unique token, right? This is because you can also reduce the size of your unique token to be able to be the size of your team. Um, so what you have to do is first compute how many, what's the range you want to go, and you can create your uh, unique token, and then you just acquire and broadcast the that uh, unique um, ID. So this is how uh, it would look like. So you look at how many uh, active team size you have. Right, so this is your compare your concurrency divided by your size. You know, you create the token, and in this case, as you can see, we create a, a size that's like larger than your number of team. Right, it's like you know 10, 20 percent larger, uh, and the reason we do that is for a performance reason. So when you're in the the CPU, there is no issue because you can take your or your uh, unique ID it can just be your uh, hardware thread ID, so you always have your own. When you have on the GPU, you think about it as having like you know an array, and then you're just going to lock one value for this array. If you have exactly the number, you'll have to go. It's be harder to uh, acquire, uh, you know, an ID. So that's why you want to make make it slightly larger, so that it makes it easier to get an ID. So. Here is what's happening. You acquire the ID, and then we use the single, uh, you know, functions that we saw earlier, and we broadcast the value. And then here we use a single to release it again. You know, so this is the difference. Here we are going to broadcast the value, but here there is no, uh, there is nothing to uh, broadcast. Uh, you probably want, you know, to have a buyer here, so that. Uh, you know, you don't release it while some are still, you know, using it. And so this is um, the last uh, exercise of the day. And it's to, you know, use this uh, unique token. So, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you 10 minutes, but this is, you know, the end. We just have here the summary. So if you have any questions about anything we've done uh, during the last two days, just you know, feel free to ask. Sure, like one more slide because I think a lot of you have asked about uh, like how, like how easy or difficult it is to. Uh, can you guys see my slide? Yes. Yeah, so uh, because a couple of you have asked about like how easy it is to integrate Cocos into an existing C++ code. 
And okay, the slide is actually talking about the like you know template parameters that you can pass to any policy, like range policy or MD range policy that we saw earlier today, or even the team policy that Bruno was talking about until now. So there are multiple other options that you can pass to it, like the execution space, which is you know, if you like these are all deep, like uh, not mandatory options that you need to pass. Like, you know, if you don't pass it, it'll it'll have it has some default value that it will select. Like the execution space that we have talked about, you know, there is the default execution space. You can actually tell your loops to schedule, uh, to follow a particular schedule, like, you know, the static or dynamic, which is is what, like, if you are familiar with OpenMP, even OpenMP has these poly, uh, schedule options, right? Static schedule is like, you know, where you divide the given iteration range into like a fixed number of chunks and then give it to each thread. Dynamic does some sort of like work stealing. So if you have some load imbalance in your code, you, you can do dynamic. I mean, this is more like um, more uh, appropriate or applies more to like uh, CPU backends, but GPU backends, it's anyway dynamic because like the hardware does some sort of work stealing anyway. Uh, there's index type where you can tell uh, like if, if like you can tell like what sort of data types should be used for, you know, your indexes, like, you know, use it like int i or like size underscore ti or double i or whatever, right? By default, I think we choose like 64 bit. Uh, but if you if you don't have that much of an iteration range, you can choose 32 bit, which will like, you know, speed up some operations for you, especially if you have like, you know, a lot of index calculations. The, the, the most interesting thing is this work tag which is essentially like a another like a nested struct that you might can have in your class, right? And you can pass this to your operator, uh, like, you know, to your functor to differentiate between two different works that you can do. Like, let's say you have an existing C++ class that, you know, does different types of like for loops. Uh, and you want to use those two different for loops for like completely two different parallel patterns, right? Uh, but you can write only one operator, right, per class. So now you can distinguish those operator operators by, you know, providing the first parameter as a tag and then passing that tag to your policy as like a template parameter. And then you can, you know, uh, you can select like two different parallel parts that does two different things within the same class. This is what LAMPS does uh, um, in uh, when it when it does like, you know, uh, it might have multiple kernels within the same uh, same class, and each of them has like a specified tag to identify what it is doing. Uh, and I think this is very handy if, if you have like existing C++ codes in like, and you have classes that do like a wide variety of things. Uh, might not be that interesting for like new users who will write anything, everything from scratch up anyway and have like focus in mind. But for existing C++ users, this might be really useful. So I just wanted to to inform you guys about this because this might be useful you know in cases where you want to integrate cocos into existing c++ code base yeah this is the end uh, I, I don't have like i'm not planned for anything else but if you guys have any questions we are here if you want us to look at something or if you just want to try exercises and have some questions that's fine too